With the finance minister delivering her economic update, this week we'll hear from a major business group about what measures they hope to see. Also in the update, there are renewed calls for the Trudeau government to do more to promote green industries faced with the Biden government's hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies. Um, I think this has to be a group effort. No one country can swoop in here and solve problems. As Haiti continues to struggle with cholera, lawlessness and economic collapse, we'll hear from a Haitian-Canadian community organizer about what Canada can do to help. And Brazil swings from the far right to the far left. What does the defeat of right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro and the return of former President Lula mean for the world, for the environment and for Canada? Hello, I'm Martin Stringer, sitting in for Michael Serapio. We start tonight with the countdown to the fall federal economic update. On Thursday, Finance Minister Christian Freeland will give Canadians the government's latest report on the state of the economy. And in the daily question period in the House of Commons on Monday, the forecasts of continuing inflation and looming recession dominated debate. This week we found out 20% of Canadians are skipping meals or cutting portions to afford groceries. In fact, 1.5 million Canadians are visiting, have been, in one month, visited the food bank. And finally, speaking of food banks, the one at Jane and Finch actually got kicked out of its location because rent doubled. How much pain will Canadians have to suffer before this government can, stops its inflationary policies? Yeah. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, we understand that times are tough for Canadians, and that's why our government, since we've been office in 2015, has lifted 2 million people out of poverty. We know that it's not enough. We know that there's more to do. And that begs the question, Mr. Speaker, why did the Conservatives vote against vulnerable kids who just wanted to get their teeth looked at? Why did they vote against people who needed a $500 top-up on their housing? Why did they vote against childcare? And Mr. Speaker, we know they can't wait to cut it up. We are always going to stand on the side of Canadians. On Thursday, Finance Minister Christian Freeland will deliver her fall economic update with inflation stubbornly stuck at 40-year highs and with the Bank of Canada continuing to raise interest rates. The country's business groups are watching closely what the federal government's plans are. Joining me now is Perrin Beattie. He's President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Beattie, thanks for joining us. Glad to be with you. Okay, uh, let's look first and foremost. Uh, what is the Chamber uh, on behalf of Canadian business? What are you hoping to see? in Thursday's economic update? There's one issue, and that's growth. We need to have a strategy to promote growth. And what the minister needs to do is to set out specific specific elements of a plan that will enable us to counterbalance what, what we're looking at the present time, which is a slowdown in the economy and the potential even of a recession next year. Okay, uh, we are trying to assess, because nobody knows exactly how many measures, how many substantive measures might be in this update this week. Most of the indications are that the government won't be, will be holding off on a lot of the big announcements, obviously, until the spring budget. Are there measures, and you say growth measures, that you feel can't wait? Well, I don't think the government needs to write all sorts of checks. Uh, it does have to respond to measures like the uh, American Inflation Reduction Act, which is drawing investment out of Canada. But aside from that, the focus needs to be on low cost or no cost measures that it can take. Regulatory reform would be an example of that. Uh, the politicians should be cooling the anti-business rhetoric that drives investment from Canada. Interprovincial barriers to trade would be another. Measures uh, which can help to encourage uh, an increase in the in the workforce in Canada are also critical because that will help to, to, to deal with the one million jobs that are going begging at the present time. So they should be focusing on things that won't cost a lot of money, but which in fact in some cases could save the government money and will promote growth. Okay, tax cuts. As you know in the political arena, there's one uh, official opposition party which is calling for a rollback or a, or a freezing of taxes or new payroll deductions like EI and CPP. And those are payroll deductions that are set to increase. Uh, the Chamber's position on that? I think the most important thing is that there be no new taxes in the budget. Uh, we're seeing a lot of business bashing taking place with people talking about imposing windfall profits taxes on the energy sector or on grocery stores or in other areas. And that simply says to business, you're not wanted here. And it means that investors will take their money elsewhere. 
we need to hold the line in terms of taxes and we need to look for other ways of reducing the cost of doing business such as slashing regulation in Canada. Okay. When you heard what the Bank of Canada said, the governor last week, and he clearly said that he and the bank are expecting no growth and maybe even zero uh, negative growth uh, in the economy for at least the next three quarters, so at least the next nine months. What do you make of that in terms of wh what it's going to do to business? Well, it's not just the Bank of Canada, but it's it's every commentator at this point, including the Minister of Finance herself. They're all indicating that, that it's not going to be an easy year next year. And so what we need is policies that are clearly focused on what do we do to encourage growth in Canada. Everything else is subsidiary to that. And if, if, if you look at what the world needs today, for example, the, the minister gave an excellent speech in Washington a few days ago where she talked about what it was we could do in Canada to help the democracies be less dependent upon Vladimir Putin. She mentioned accelerating, for example, energy projects in Canada and mining projects. When what the world needs is things like fuel, food, fertilizer, some commodities that Canada has in abundance. This is this could be Canada's moment. What we need to have at this point is a, a plan and the political will to make it happen. Okay, I'm just going to get the um, a last question just to get the uh, the chambers, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce's position on this. As you've heard over the past few weeks, uh, the refrain in question period has been the Conservative uh, Party, for example, asking for a freezing of any further carbon tax. Uh, we are headed into COP27, the UN conference on climate change, starting next weekend, this coming weekend. Uh, the chamber's position on carbon taxes. Our, our highest priority is that we shouldn't be adding extra taxes in addition to what's already in, in place uh, across the board in Canada, in particular things like windfall profits taxes. And we should be looking at other ways to reduce the cost of doing business in Canada. Okay, but as for the, uh, the carbon tax, which has got an escalator, it's going to continue to go up until yeah. 2030. The, the carbon tax is in place today, and the government needs to look at what are the impacts based on where the economy is at the time of any increase in the carbon tax. And it needs to ask itself, obviously, with the much higher prices that Canadians are paying for energy today, is it necessary to, to have a further increase at this time? But there are other measures that it can take by holding the line on all other taxes and on uh, reducing other costs of doing business by slashing a regulation and doing away with interprovincial barriers to trade, which could send a very, very positive message. Okay, Mr. Beattie, thank you very much for taking the time. We'll keep in contact and we'll watch the uh, economic statement on Thursday with interest. Thanks a lot. We will all be watching with interest. One of the things some people will be watching for in this week's economic update is whether there'll be any increase in federal subsidies for clean technologies. Natural Resources Minister Jonathan Wilkinson is on the record already saying the Trudeau government will have to do more to catch up to the Biden administration in the U.S., which has announced hundreds of billions of dollars in subsidies to hydrogen and batteries and carbon capture and storage. Warren Maybe is the director of the Institute for Energy and Environmental Policy at Queen's University, and he joins us now. Professor Maybe, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, let's start with you know what we've been hearing: uh, many calls for Canada to up its game uh, in terms of clean energy incentives and subsidies. Uh, Biden administration it's, it's announced more than four hundred billion dollars Canadian in incentives over ten years. Uh, that's for hydrogen, carbon, EV batteries, etc. What's your reaction to those calls for us to up our game? It'd be very hard for us to compete directly with the United States. And we've seen this before when the U.S. decides to open up the floodgates. Uh, it makes a big difference because they are the biggest funders of R&D and new technology development in the world. Um, you know, we saw this years ago with biofuels where they, they really invested heavily in biofuels over a very short period and, and moved the needle significantly. We're seeing it again uh, around hydrogen now and, and carbon capture and different technologies. Canada can't compete with all of those one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, I do think it's important that we stay competitive, but we're probably going to have to pick our battles. Which, which battle do we really want to fight? Which technology do we really want to chase? Which one do you think we should? I mean, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that we do have some big advantages with hydrogen and the hydrogen economy, and certainly Alberta has been leading the way on a lot of development uh, in that space. It's nice because it fits well with our existing expertise in oil and gas, 
And it's nice because hydrogen is a dispatchable energy source. It's an energy source with some problems, but it is a dispatchable energy source. And that's one of the things that we really need to complement things like solar and wind uh, that are you know, abundant, but not dispatchable, intermittent at best, mm -hmm. and, and hard to predict. What about carbon capture technology? Because I think when uh, Jonathan Wilkinson, I referenced uh, the uh, Natural Resources Minister, was quoted on it, he seemed to be reacting to the fact that the uh, states has gone out so much further, faster on tax breaks, basically, for carbon capture technology. As you know, in the environmental com in community, uh, there's not a, it's not a, doesn't seem to be of one mind on whether carbon capture and, and, and uh, and sequestration capture, uh, yeah. is he even working or worth giving tax breaks to? Yeah, and it is a very controversial technology. Certainly the environmental community uh, here in Canada and elsewhere around the world has seen that technology often as a subsidy for uh, the oil and gas sector who would utilize the technology first and, and probably foremost. Um, I think that it, it works, you know, and there's really good evidence that it can work, but it can be expensive. And so technologies that can help add value to that process, whether it's taking carbon out of the air and turning it into something useful, uh, whether it's technology that can actually, you know, save us money somewhere else in the system, that's probably where we need to go with this. But yeah, it's going to be controversial no matter how you slice it. It's also controversial because the way it was announced in the last budget, there's a sort of a phase out incentive. We will give you a tax, a tax uh, cut, but that tax cut is disappearing in 10 years time. In other words, we want you to get out of the business of emitting. That's right. Yeah. And a lot of people really can't square the circle of the oil and gas sector investing in these technologies, but also phasing out their mm -hmm. production. And uh, if we're really going to achieve the very deep emission uh, reduction targets that we've set, a large portion of those emissions that come with oil and gas production have to be phased out. There's really no two ways around it. Okay, uh, last point briefly, uh, and this is just sort of a thumbnail sketch. Uh, Canada and all the other international delegations are heading into COP27 this weekend, starts this weekend in Egypt. Uh, what's on the agenda? So there's a bunch of things they're going to focus on emissions and, and try to uh, once again get the world to focus on bringing those emissions down. Certainly we've seen reports lately that it's not going down as fast as, as we need them to see them go. Okay. There's going to be a focus on adaptation and we're seeing so much you know, in terms of flooding and fires and droughts around the world. We need to start adapting to that and there will be a lot of discussion. A lot of the focus, I think, will be on money, on the financing side. You know, the parties have made a hundred billion dollar a year commitment to uh, help tackle climate change around the world. People want to know how that money is going to be spent and where it's going to be spent and what communities are going to benefit. So I think that's going to be a lot of the discussion uh, okay. at the meeting. Last question briefly, we only have a few seconds, but how would you describe the atmosphere going into this COP27, this latest UN round uh, with, you know, world a war going on in the world, uh, with a recession looming, with inflation, with all sorts of regional conflicts, uh, with a pandemic still looming over us? How would you describe the focus on COP27? I, I honestly think it's a little less urgent than it has been in the past, although, you know, climate scientists still see the pressure and, and feel the pressure. I think the people around the world are reacting to those immediate concerns of energy security, war and destabilization around the world. And that's where a lot of people's attention is focused. Which doesn't necessarily bode very well for getting uh, work done on the, on the environment. It, it might not go as well as we'd hoped, although we can always hope for the best. All right. Professor Maybe, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. The Canadian government is still trying to decide how we can best help the people of Haiti as they struggle with a cholera epidemic, economic collapse, and lawlessness at the hands of criminal gangs. Today, Canada's ambassador to Haiti, Sébastien Carrière, appeared before the Commons Foreign Affairs Committee, and he told MPs that Canada's long involvement with Haiti means there are high expectations. People expect Canada to take on a leadership role. Uh, we have a very good reputation in uh, in Haiti. Um, we're well respected. Um, people come to us seeking our advice, our views on on what they could do, um, and that's important to leverage that in the favor of a, a 
you know, good resolution to, to this current uh, crisis for Haiti. But also, um, I think this has to be a, a group effort. No one country can swoop in here and solve problems that have been going on since uh, the fall of the dictatorship, and some would argue even before. For his reactions to the situation in Haiti and what role Canada can possibly play, I'm joined now by Patrick Auguste. Monsieur Auguste is a Haitian-Canadian and he's a community organizer. Monsieur Auguste, first of all, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Can we start with what you're hearing from friends and family about the situation in Haiti? Many people are describing it as about as bad as it's ever, ever been. Yeah, it's a fear. And a little uh, thing that uh, we are almost have no hope because it's uh, getting worse and worse. And uh, we don't see any windows to go out from that. Yeah. We're, we're hearing about a lack of medicines. We're hearing about the cholera epidemic, which is now re- spreading. Mm. We have food running out. We have a complete economic breakdown. Mm. And we have these criminal gangs who've taken over large parts of Port-au-Prince and other parts of the country. What should Canada do? For me, is um, I think Canada can do something, uh, definitely, because um, in the last years, I think Canada it didn't play a big role there. It had a role about a little bit behind the scene. And uh, uh, let's say that we had uh, some intervention in the past years. You have the United States, you have Brazil, you have uh, other countries like that. But Canada should uh, come like a new actors if it really takes the leadership of this. That means uh, what I think Canada could do is uh, um, going to the, let's say, uh, you have a new person on the table, and uh, they could, um, uh, let's say, first thing is their presence there, let's say, to the military, could um, um, lead to uh, some uh, calm down mm-hmm. of those weapons that, uh, every, that you see that some have some a break right and starting from this break and then we could uh, uh, it could lead to more effective discussion between the di- the different actors asian actors okay so because you're talking what here, so you're talking sorry? about a type of ceasefire and a type of intervention uh, getting between yeah. the parties but what about people who say because a lot of your haitian compatriots say that any multilateral intervention so far is tainted because it's coming at the request of the president, Ariel Henry. Uh, Monsieur Henry was not elected and he himself has been accused of being affiliated with the criminal gangs right now that are causing so much trouble. So a lot of people are saying, no, this, even this mission is not right because it's starting off wrong. It's starting off at the request of Monsieur Henry, the president Henry. Yeah, I hear that. But you know what? We have more than one year the president have been killed over there Jovenel Moïse, elected president, and uh, we don't have any uh, solution coming in. Uh, what happened is uh, because uh, in the past, the military from foreign countries did some abuse of the local population. Mm-hmm. Let's say, for example, the women, uh, kids, uh, poor people have been really abused by this military. It's not the Canadian, mm-hmm. but, uh, you know, you have an international force there. That means now there is a kind of anger against uh, the military from foreign countries. But what happens is, when you have two bad things coming to you, generally you will choose what is the less worst, that is yeah. The, 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 yeah, the minimum uh, between the two, right? Mm-hmm. I think now the majority of people would prefer to have an intervention from foreign countries, let's say for, with a Canadian leadership, for example, instead of uh, uh, staying there, the situation. Because what happened, it's like everyone feel in jail. You cannot go out yeah. to buy some bread. You cannot go out to go to the school for the kids. The kids are closed now. They cannot work. To go to work, people are really taking risk. Uh, almost every time you, you hear that people have been shot, uh, during that weekend, there was a famous uh, political leader, Jean Baptiste, was a guy with a speech, a very uh, moderate speech, and he was killed again. And that means, uh, uh, I think in that situation, even me, you know, when you talk about Asian, though with Asian, 
because we were the first nation uh, to carry independence, and the black nation to uh, independence in 2000, let's say 1804, that we are proud of that. But the we have to admit, we have to be honest. Now we cannot do it by ourselves. We need that help for mm -hmm. our friends. Our do, good friends. Do you feel then, you seem to be saying that you, you feel that Canada then, if any nation were to lead this, it should be Canada because of our good standing in the country. Canada has sent an exploratory mission to Haiti. We know that a, a week ago or two weeks ago, we sent in some armored vehicles to help the Haitian police. But this is going to have to be, to some extent, an armed intervention because of the criminal gangs. Uh, you yeah, think that, sure. It, mm -hmm. Go, ahead. Go ahead. No, you think that uh, that's going to be necessary too? Yeah, that means uh, that's not enough because what happened, uh, let's say that, uh, no, that's not enough. Because what happened, I, I think that uh, whatever the situation, when we have uh, someone else coming in, uh, like a new person, a new face, uh, let's say, uh, as I said earlier, you, it can lead to that ceasefire, that first thing. Secondly, you know, international speaking, Canada, not just in Haiti, uh, the, the fact that Canadian generally army is not aggressive, they're more like Peace Corp. Let's say you have the situation in the past in South Africa, the, when, uh, you know, doing the apartheid stuff, that we know that Canadian play, played a good role, a positive role, a peace role that everyone recognized. That means uh, what we need uh, is that uh, extra person coming in the debate now around the table. But what I said, very important, I think that you should have a kind of evaluation uh, about the previous intervention, because, you know, there are remorse, people are saying things. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. would be good that we have a statement, maybe from the United Nations. May, I don't know. we we'll say well, we did that in the wrong is past. We did that. We did that. Now we're going to work on okay. correct those mistakes that they don't repeat anymore. If the Asian people, as a, an official statement like that, we recognize what you did wrong. We're not going to do that uh, again. We're going to have some... A special measure to avoid that, that we, it will build confidence. And, uh, and and what I think very important, the discussion has not to stay just with the government, okay. because the government, people are lost their right. confidence in the okay. government. And it, yeah, we have to open the discussion with more people around the table. All right, wonderful. We are, are we are out of time, unfortunately, but we will speak again. We'll watch this as it goes. We'll see what the Canadian government's decision is. Monsieur Auguste, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Brazil's 215 million people have elected a left-leaning president, ousting a controversial far-right populist. Yesterday, they elected a former president, Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, better known to Brazilians simply as Lula. He has defeated the controversial Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro was uh, widely criticized for human rights abuses, including opening up the Amazon rainforest to developments and his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, which left Brazil with one of the highest death rates in the world. World. Andre Pergurini is a historian and a political observer. He's the author of, or he's one of the contributors to the Brazilian Report. He joins us now from Farmville, Virginia. Professor Pergurini, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. Okay, let's start with, I mean, you are a longtime uh, watcher and writer on Brazilian politics. What do you make of this political sea change in Brazil? I think the first thing to note is that it's a very strong repudiation of Bolsonaro's four-year term. This is the first time since re-election was allowed to incumbents that the incumbent has not won. Uh, usually, the power of the incumbency is very significant. Uh, we saw Bolsonaro in the final days of the campaign really trying to use the machinery of the state to get himself re-elected, and it, it failed. Um, so this is, I think, the major takeaway is that the Brazilian people the fourth largest democracy in the world, uh, soundly rejected Bolsonaro's brand of uh, far-right authoritarianism. Um, okay. And it matters for the region. Okay, let's, well, let's, and, and for the world and for Canada, let's, uh, let's look at one of the aspects of that. Our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, has joined the ranks of leaders congratulating President Lula on his victory. Uh, he says he welcomes working with him and working to advance shared priorities like protecting the environment. So he's, a, of course, he's referring to preserving the rainforest. How much do you think President Lula's election will change the approach to saving the rainforest, which came, for, you know, came open to development under President Bolsonaro? This was less of an issue during the campaign than I would have expected. 
Uh, but I do think it will figure prominently in, in Lula's attempt to sort of reintroduce Brazil uh, to the world. Brazil's standing has really diminished under Bolsonaro, and the, the Amazon rainforest will be a major part of what he tries to do. Now, one of the arguments Bolsonaro made during the campaign was that uh, deforestation was actually higher under the Workers' Party than under his administration, which may statistically be true, but no other government in Brazilian history has reduced deforestation by as much as Lula did as president. So Lula will come into power asserting that Brazil knows how to reign in deforestation. It's committed to doing so. And I think this has a lot of world leaders who are interested in preserving the Amazon around the world very much, uh, very enthusiastic about what a new Lula administration will mean in that regard. Okay, President Putin and Chinese President Xi have also congratulated President Lula on his victory. They talked about the desire to further the development of the so-called BRIC block of countries, this new economic and political block of uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, and China. Now, uh, former President Bolsonaro was neutral on the issue of Vladimir Putin's war on Ukraine. Uh, President Lula has been quoted as, he, as being fairly neutral as well, saying he thinks there's blame on both sides. Where do you think Brazil's position will go in terms of the issue of the Western Front against Vladimir Putin. It's interesting. You mentioned the wave of world leaders who are congratulating Lula today. One of them, very recently, was uh, President Vladimir Zelensky of of uh, Ukraine, who uh, noted his eagerness to work with Brazil. And you're right, though. During the campaign, Lula refused to cast Ukraine as entirely blameless in this war. So this will be a very uh, early major test of Lula's diplomacy of what to do about uh, what should Brazil's position be. Uh, you're right that Bolsonaro himself was also neutral in a way that I think Lula, for different reasons, uh, will arrive at perhaps a similar position, which is that diplomacy is necessary. Neither side is entirely blameless, blameless but also criticizing Russia's role for the war itself. Um, I think this is part of a larger strategic Re, uh, reset that Lula will attempt to carry out on the world stage. Of course, during his time in office, Brazil reached really prominent levels of global engagement. Uh, Brazil was looked to very often to mediate uh, regional disputes, international disputes. I think Lula is eager to reassert that role. Of course, the world today is much more, it's much different than it was 20 years ago with new challenges and new actors. So the Ukraine issue will be a key early test. Something interesting to watch. Well, listen, we will keep in contact, and I want to thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm happy to come back next time to talk more about Brazil. Well, that's it for this edition of Primetime Politics. I'm Martin Stringer. On behalf of all of us here at CPAC, thanks for watching.